All right. Well, Neil, thank you for joining us. I appreciate you um, you taking the time. This is pretty awesome getting to see you here. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, I feel like you all have had uh, like a super interesting journey from early days. You know, one of the things we always love to hear about is like origin story, um, first gigs and whatnot. Um, I think Kevin and I have heard a little bit about that, but do you remember? Is there anything that you might want to share? <laughs> no, ours, ours, my <clears throat> my joining the band was pretty interesting. Um, I had a lot of other bands. This is like 2009 um, when I was living in Boston, going to Berkeley. Um, I had a fun kind of we called it bluesadelic funkicide as the genre. So this was like is a band called the Cashed Fools, and uh, it was like Jimi Hendrix, Chili Peppers crazy high energy stuff. And um, around that time, a bunch of things, I had been playing percussion for several groups, just random people that I met who had percussion and had interest in having some percussion be performed with them. So uh, I was just kind of doing that. And then the other thing I was doing was my, it was like my landlord's brother had a party trolley company. And so I would have, I would set up to either for my own show or a friend's band's show, have the party trolley take everybody to the show and then back to, you know, another location for an after party or something like that. And so I'd asked Dopapod to do an after party for the Cash Fool show um, with the party trolley thing and all that. And Eli was like, yeah, I'm super down. Uh, let's do it. And then as it neared, the party trolley thing didn't work out. And then they also had to leave to go play for uh, the uh, Hetty Fest music festival in upstate New York. So uh, he was like, yo, so we can't do the gig, but you should come with us and just come to this festival. I was like, okay, cool. And then since I had been playing percussion with people, I was like, do you guys have any interest in having some percussion on the show? And they were like, yeah. So leading up to it, I just brought like a conga and a cowbell to the rehearsal space because they actually lived up the street from me. Um, and we just kind of jammed in there and everybody was feeling it. So that's how we kind of put that together. So then when we did that, that first gig was this um, upstate New York music festival. And I brought, you know, like way too much extra percussion and stuff like that. But <clears throat> um, Mikey Karuba of like Turquoise and all that was, was playing drums at the time. So we organized this like great, you know, long percussion drum uh, through composed thing. Uh, so that was a highlight from that. Um, but yeah, that was the first gig. Yeah, and he passed the torch to you at that point. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and there was a, there was a fun year or so where we were both in, or all three of us were in both bands. Uh, so I was also playing percussion turquoise back then. Uh, nice. Oh, cool. So can you remind me like, about what years was that or what year was that? I think that, <clears throat> I think that first gig was 2009 and then okay. somewhere, probably summer of 2010 was when we, we broke and, off because both uh, bands were just doing too much. So is this yeah. the lineup and the lineup has been intact since then, or have you had anybody else come and go uh, for Dopapod? Um, yeah. yeah, there was a couple years where I was out and there was a different drummer named Scotty's Wang um, from like 2013 to 16. And then I came back. Cool. All right. So we're up to 16. Why don't we jump to 18 and you guys took a break. Um, yeah for a little bit i read something uh eli said i believe it was expressing concern of not having fans to come back to after the hiatus and i found that interesting because it had always seemed to me that you guys had a pretty good community built around you and they were yeah. going to come back what did you like learn going through the hiatus about yourself about the band and what made you guys come back uh yeah so it was kind of a. Uh... Funny is not quite the right word, but when they brought up having to, wanting to take a break, I was like, yeah, like you, I, I had just been out for like three years. So it was like, I knew what it was like to step away from it and, and, um, uh, do other things with my time for a bit. Cause it can be very all encompassing. Oh, just, obviously just be touring for gosh. At that point they were going seven years straight. Doing a uh, doing on a, a half hour podcast can be all consuming yeah, sometimes yeah. for me in a band. I can imagine <laughs> being in a band. Exactly. So <clears throat> when they mentioned it, it was like, oh yeah, that definitely needs to happen. Um, and it just for me, I could see that it was going to be great for everybody. 
And of course, it was <clears throat> stressful at first. Everybody was like, what am I going to do with my time? How am I going to make some money? Things like that. Like, uh, you know, are we going to have fans to come back to? In And in those things, and from my experience, I knew that <clears throat> everybody would be just fine. It would just be a bit of a learning curve or some discomfort for a second. But so it was good. It's good to watch that happen for everybody, too, you know. Um, and, yeah, I wasn't worried about fans. Uh, the thing that can be a bummer is, like, momentum. Because you might be, like, mm -hmm. building something and getting a little bit of steam behind you. About to make uh, that jump to, like, theaters or whatever. From <clears throat> yeah, yeah. The next size bar or whatever it happens to be, sure. Totally. But it's like, you know, at what cost? Like, if we had kept going, mm -hmm. probably just would have imploded. And then and then, there, then there was no band for any fans at all. So, yeah. So, like, that time, um, I mean, do you feel you came back with like a different mindset in any way, or maybe just like renewed motivation. Like sometimes that can really be so personally like yeah. enlightening, I think to have some so, of that break. Yeah, I would say 100% because um, it, it's like, it's like a, maybe a mini like ego death or at least just like, you know, the personality, that person who was me, the dope pod drummer had then moved on and then you learn that everything's okay when that happens. And so then you, you can go through the experience again without all of that sort of fear or concern that, you know, that your whole identity is resting on this endeavor or whatever. And, and that way you can, you can take it seriously without having to take yourself so seriously and that kind of stuff. Nice. And it, this break led to a mid time. Um, you want to talk a little bit about how that happened? I guess it was all composed and written while you were apart, or was it something that you did when you got back together? I said, see the, I'm, I'm happy to say I'm at the fun stage in the, in this band's career where all the recording sessions blend together and I forget <laughs> which ones were what and when we did it. Um, but yeah, we had, <clears throat> we had worked on some stuff. Uh, you know, Eli writes a lot, so he was just working a lot the whole time. Um, so he spent a good amount of time doing all that. And, and there were a couple songs I think on there that, that were pretty old that were even might've been written during the time that I was gone. Um, so as it always is with an album, you're like, well, you know, what tracks are we going to put on? We record too many, you know, definitely had like from the previous album, I think there was even two that from the recording session of the previous album, Mega Jam that ended up on a mid time, which is fun to get it that way too. Cause then you're just like, all right, yeah, we're just putting it in, getting all this stuff down. Mm -hmm. And the, then you the, can kind of be really flexible about how to put the whole thing together uh, to make it like, a, you know, a concise it, piece. Do you think in terms of LPs or CDs, CDs run 70 minutes and I've like, I I'm doing a best of 22 mm -hmm. list. And a lot of these albums that came out this year are 30, 35 minutes. And I'm like, that's an album. That's like the perfect amount of music I want yeah. at one time from a band as opposed to a 70 minute CD, which <laughs> it seems like there's a lot of filler a lot of yeah. times with that. Yeah. It's weird. It's like, um, like I'm a huge fan of King Gizzard and everything that they're doing is just like right up my alley. They'll deliver like a few songs or this new album. That's, you know, like all of a sudden comes out one day and it's two 15 minute tracks or oh. Whatever. So I like that they just they they have no rules and no prescribed way of doing it. And I think that that's that's what I like to do. Um, we always with this band. Now that we've done a couple of vinyls, we do fall into that like you know limiting the time thing. But then of course this one was a double vinyl, so mm -hmm. it's also pretty long. But it's not super long. But, but it's, the, yeah. you, you mean the most recent, the self-titled? Yeah. Yes. So I just I just hope that the product will come together out of the desire for the concise total art piece versus like, Oh, we can only do 22 minutes. Oh, we have to do 60, you know, but, but it always, <clears throat> it never quite works that way. There's always some weird, uh, sacrifice made in some way, you know, either by too many songs or too few. <laughs> I guess there's no such thing as perfect balance with any of that. Um, when you were talking about, you know, 
kind of having a lot of stuff going on. Um, your all's tours are are just insane to me. Like I think about um, just the dates that you all do. Um, and like three lifetimes ago, when I was working for a band, we did tours like that five, six weeks at a time. And yeah. you're gone and you're in a different place every single night. Um, that was a long time ago for me. But like, is that something that you all just love? Because I loved being on the road. I could do that forever um but like I don't know for all of you like do you have uh do you have times where you're like man it would be (laughs) it would be great to maybe do like you know a couple weeks here and there are you all just like super stoked on yeah on like getting out there and going to all those places yeah it's it's it has its ups and downs and we have our we have days where we're stoked and days where we're not um we try to work out a formula where it doesn't feel like we're gone for too long but it doesn't feel like we're not putting in the, the good effort. And it's, you know, you have to think about uh, the logistics and the financials of it. If we're getting a bus or a bandwagon, like the days before and after the shows cost a lot of money. So if you have short stints out, then you have more of those days before and after to pay for. And so you have to find the most efficient, you know, balance of doing that. Um, But this, a year ago, uh, like last October, the tour that we did was actually like the first tour that we did in like five years. It felt like because we had done the break and then we did like 20 shows or something after we came back from the hiatus and then pandemic. So, Mm -hmm. and it was one of these, I was out there on that tour and I was like, man, we haven't done this in like four or five years, like this multiple nights in a row, multiple weeks in a row. And the best part about all that stuff is how you play because you just get so tight. I just, I call it tour tight because you ever see a band that's like never gone on like a long tour and they come back from like a month of straight shows and they're like, they might think that they're, you know, only playing okay. And it's like, you guys are so locked in right now. Right. So getting, you have to be out, uh, you know, several days to be able to get that. That's, that's like my favorite part about it. But yeah, after like three weeks is when it gets hairy for everybody. Uh, <laughs> And it'll look like on the calendar, it'll look like we're doing four weeks, but it ends up being like five weekends. And yeah. we're like, wait, what happened? I thought we were only doing four weeks. <laughs> Definitely. And then depending on where you end up and where you got to go next. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Those days, those days can add up for sure. But I love it. I love to see um, you guys out there and just hit in so many different cities. I think it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, it's been great it... to get back to all the places because there are definitely a lot that we missed and they yeah. definitely missed us. Uh, I guess it's tough too with inflation, yeah. um, with gas prices. I mean, everything. Everyone's trying to make their money that they didn't make during quarantine. So I'm sure that that's a whole added thing. Do you guys sleep in the van? Do you have? Do you get to get hotel rooms? Uh, so we have been doing. Um, we did a bus last year, like a real actual bus. Oh, nice. that was the first time we did that. That was amazing. Um, and it also like before that we had been kind of doing a, a very strict limit of like three weekends out in the van because it's rough Mm -hmm. being in the van for so long is tough because we're not, we're not young, fresh kids anymore. Um, (laughs) so, but now the bus, of course, the gas is insanely expensive, but there's a really cool company called bandwagon, which has like a RV type bus. So it's like an RV but it has bunks and like nice full size fridge. So you can have those kind of amenities. Right. Um, and so that way, yeah, we sleep, we just sleep right there. Every once in a while we'll get a hotel either for like a, so we have a shower room or right. a couple of days off. And like, cause the funny thing about the bandwagon is that the generator has to stay on the whole time. So it's just like always. Uh, so I, had like, a, I had a guy after the fish Merryweather shows, he said, can, my kids stay at your house. And I was like, sure. His kid's like 19 and he shows up and he's like, I'm going to sleep in my van. Can I run an extension cord and plug in the generator? I was like, dude, sleep in my house. What do you mean you're going to sleep in the van in front of my house? It's like, I would prefer to not run a weird extension cord to a van. (laughs) I'm not going to lie. Depending on where the hotel was, I used to prefer sleeping in the railroad earth van at times. There's Just because I knew it. <laughs> is Chuck, it disgusting Chuck always, as it was? Yeah. No, yeah. Chuck would always do that because he <laughs> he knows the game of of checking into the hotel 
even just getting up to the room. All this is like minutes lost sleeping. And right. he's just like, no, I'm just going to sleep in the van. And <laughs> totally. I will be know. dead asleep and you guys will still be flicking around the TV trying to yeah. fall asleep. Yeah. And you can't miss the next morning's call or lose the keys considerably yeah. to be, mm-hmm. if, you, if you're already there. So yeah, totally. less stress. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I've heard so many horror stories about bands getting their vans jacked and things yeah. like and that. that is that is the bonus of sleeping in the van is if something were to happen, you it's might your be able guard, to right? yeah, yeah. Your guard. So, so let me ask you, you, you played in DC not long ago and you had a yeah. special guest. Do you want to talk about how that happened? Are we talking about Ben Zell from P funk? No, I'm just oh. kidding. Uh, <laughs> we did. We had lots of great guests that night. Um, and then the, the super random, very unplanned one was uh, the great Billy Strings, uh, who was playing, had, you know, big sold out show right down the street and then uh, and came by. And it was pretty funny because we didn't know, you know, if he was going to come. I think we had emailed him, but didn't hear back. Um, but, uh, you know, we had all the uh, some of the guys from the mm-hmm. P-Funk band were playing in the opening band. So we had them sitting in, which was fun. Some of the Pigeons playing ping pong guys were there. So they sat in. And so when Gator from Pigeons was on drums, I was up walking around and I looked at my phone and in our group thread, our light guy had said like, hey, Billy's outside trying to get in or like he can't get in or something silly like that. That was like, what? Like, Do you know who okay, I am? Weird. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, so I was like, OK, maybe he's going to get over here. And then I sat down again and this guy, the stage is very close to the people and everything. And this guy, this old guy was like, hey, man, Billy's outside. And I was like. Well, get him the fuck in here. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know. Someone help him out. Yeah, let's do it. It's, it, um, it's cool. I, I hear some bluegrass influences sometimes in some of what you do. I mean, obviously, that isn't your forte, but do right. you think it worked well? It. The best part about it is that he was, you know, we, he's just clearly a great guitar player. And I've known some of his stuff in the past was like, he does a lot of heavy metal things, uh, which has been the the funny joke about the rise of Billy is that like all of a sudden everybody likes bluegrass and all of a sudden everybody likes metal. And as a person that played in metal bands that didn't really get much like attention for that was people would be like, Oh, I don't like metal. And then they go watch Billy play metal song and they're like, Woo, I love Iron Maiden. And it's, <laughs> it's true. So anyways, he came in and played, you know, one of our rock songs and it, it was just a great like guitar moment. Cause you know, Rob, Rob does a lot of very old timey, you know, guitar stuff like that, that is in the Americana or the shredding, like Django kind of stuff, which is so great. And we have a handful of songs that kind of have that influence, but we only t- sort of touch it in like that level of jam band. You know, like, oh, we're a jam band and we can play some bluegrass. Like, you know, I'd say we maybe used to go into that like more often when it was like, you know, just trying out vibes and material uh, sure, yeah. as you're growing. Um but uh, it's fascinating to watch that with bands. I mean, uh, the most obvious is fish, you know, they added, they had Reverend Jeff Moser with them, you know, when they learned the whole bluegrass thing and they did all the jazz standards and yeah. all of that was just them sucking it in so they could create their own thing. Yeah, totally. So yeah. So, no, the, and then the moment with Billy was great. He just, it was just some, just classic two guitars playing a rock song. The funny right. part was I kind of had to like, I couldn't hear him very well. That was like our own little mix thing. Um, so I was playing kind of like a little more reserved, but the attention of the crowd was what was insane. It's like people were just kind of standing there at our show and anything else. And Billy was on and they were just like, <laughs> like in our faces. It was crazy. <laughs> Push it up against the stage. No, yeah. you where, where were you? A Pearl Street warehouse? Uh, this was, what was it called? Union stage. Oh, Union stage. Okay, right, yeah. right. That's that's the Pearl Street's the little one, then Union stage, and then yeah. next you'll be playing the anthem is what yeah. you're looking for. So I'm hoping. <laughs> that's what you're hoping. <laughs> oh, you got any, you got something, Amanda? Yeah. Well, I'm to? just a little maybe switcheroo. So Neil, I know I know um the answer to this, but I always think it's important to chat about like other things you have going on too. So side projects, other collaborations. Um, I'd love for you to just chat a little bit about some of that. Cause I know you always have different things happening. I do have lots of bands. Uh, <laughs> fun thing about being a drummer is you get to sort of support other people's musical vision. So you get to spread out. Uh, but yeah, I have another project called photon with a good friend, Jimmy Dunstan. He's a keyboard player. 
And then uh, my one of my longest music collaborators, Dan Africano on bass. Um, he now is playing in Thievery Corporation, um, which is like a perfect gig for him. Um, and then another band I have uh, with Dan is called Elephant Wrecking Ball. And it features a trombone player as well. And it's like weird and jazzy and funky. Nice. And I love the name. Out to space. All that stuff. And I know Photon is, you all are repped through Color Red. We, yeah, we did, an, uh, right? we did two albums um, over there. It's actually kind of right down the street uh, from my house. And yes. yeah, we've, we've actually done an Elephant Wrecking Ball one there um, and a few things. So it's cool to just have that resource down the street. Great we find studio. these on Bandcamp? Is that where we find this stuff? All of these are on Bandcamp. Some, I think they're on Spotify and all that stuff too. Um, oh, I was just thinking of, I had another band with Chuck called Mom and Dad, um, which we haven't done stuff in a while. And I think that the album, you know, it, it didn't renew on the main platforms, but it's still on Bandcamp. Um, but I know at least everything's on Bandcamp. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And nice. Kevin, you can edit this out, but... Um... That's nice that you live down the road from Color Red because getting in and out of that driveway is ridiculously difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I've I, I get scared every time I have to do it. <laughs> yeah, I just park in the back. <laughs> Good call. Like around the corner. <laughs> yeah, Kevin, it's it's crazy busy road. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Um, they are uh, all right. So you're talking about the studio. I, I'm fascinated by, I saw the Twitch last year, earlier this year, when you released your new album, self-titled, and it has a game with mm -hmm. it. You want to talk a little bit about the game, how that came about? Yeah, totally. So uh, our former lighting designer uh, and sound guy, Luke Stratton, <coughs> excuse me, he's a big nerd, and he spent uh, most of the pandemic uh, learning or drawing maps for dungeons and dragons and mm. so and you could apparently you can do this and make money on it he has like the page he he did a patreon so well that patreon was like this is how you do it like you know recognized him as like one of these guys yeah which is just about how he rolls with everything he does but he so he was making all this maps and doing all these things and we were working on the album we we're talking about artwork and just somewhere in there somebody said like oh it'd be so cool to like make this out artwork a game or something and that was the the seed that planted and we decided to have luke do the do the artwork so he sort of designed the board and then mostly me with a little bit of help we sort of designed the rules um how to make it like a game because you can go pretty deep uh into the world of trying to like design a game or doing all this thing and we were like we just got to make it simple where you could buy you could buy this at a record store, not know it was a game, get home, open it up, and play the game. So like mm -hmm. we did create pieces and little dice and stuff like that, but totally unnecessary. You can just get home and play the game. Now, is it involved with listening to the album? I think there are some bonus rules where like because it so the the layout of the game is that you're sort of going through the, the world of Dopapod or the worlds, and so each space is a song name from the current or previous albums. I think there's a bonus where if you land on a space that is the song you're listening to, you know, something happens. Nice. But that's about it. But yeah, obviously you should just listen to us. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> it's fantastic. I, I love, one of the things I love about you guys is you aren't afraid to do some instrumentals. You know, a lot of bands feel like every song has to have words and you guys embrace not having to have words. Yeah. What was and up with Toxic? It just popped in my oh, head. <laughs> nice. Um, you mean the Britney Spears? Yeah, the Britney Spears <laughs> jam you did, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, that was, that song had always stood out to me as, like, one of the, you know, darker, more interesting Britney songs. And then, yeah, one day I was just kind of, like, playing it on the synth. And that's that's something we do that's, like, that's one of my favorite ways that we do covers is where we don't just play it as perfect to the song that it is our version sometimes can be like the vocal melodies on the synth or on guitar or something like that. Um, yeah. As we started as instrumental and it was definitely one of those things a couple of years in, somebody was like, if you guys sang like probably more girls will come and you sell some more tickets. And, <laughs> and I get that. It's, uh, there, it's well, when, somewhat true, but, when, but now, you know, we still make sure that we do some instrumental stuff. And, and we just had uh, this last weekend, 
Rob had to sit out of the show that we just played in Miami, and we had the great Tim Palmieri from Kung Fu and all, and now in Lotus and everything, play the Rob set with us. Rob had a baby, right? Uh, Rob was expecting, yeah, so he just needed to, you know, stick around. Um, but, uh, and so the set list for that was definitely all instrumental, and it was fun to do like 75 minutes of all instrumental because we haven't done that in who knows how long. And it was great. It's just a good throwback old school but, set. Um, when Stop Making Sense, when the inside of the original album, it had a book and it asked questions and David Byrne answered him. And one of them was, why did the songs have lyrics? And his answer was, if you want people to pay attention to the music, you have to have the lyrics. There's definitely something to that. <laughs> yeah. I, I love the instrumental, though. It's, you know. Yeah. yeah. We, we definitely come from like the jazz and kind of funk background, which is totally instrumental uh in the or you know, those versions of that we were into um even you know some of the progressive metal and punk rock stuff that i listened to i would find a lot of stuff that was that didn't have vocals and was always drawn to that so yeah totally and i'm a girl i love the instrumentals <laughs> <laughs> i i wonder like just in general with um like as times change and you know crowds get younger I stay the same age, but other people seem to get younger uh, that are coming to shows. I mean, I hope that as time goes on, there's still that appetite for, you know, longer uh, kind of free form stuff. But yeah. I definitely could see how that needs to be maybe consideration at I think, some yeah, point. It, it was a thought at some point and it probably did. It helped us in that way, like at the time. Um, and I think that when we were first starting to do it, it was very like we were interested in it, you know, we wanted to like tell some stories and do that kind of stuff, which is like, that's, it should be for that, not to sell, you know, specific tickets. <laughs> and the funny thing too, is like, people are like, cool, you guys have vocals now. We love it. And it's like, we jam for an hour out of an hour and a half at least. And there's no vocals in there. So and, it's like, you know, and, and what's the, one, what's, change. the one song is like, stop. That's like the whole vocal to it. Oh, we have a song called Nerds. Yeah. And the only words in that song are the words, no words. Right. I think that's the one you're thinking of. See, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's a beautiful thing. You mentioned you like metal and stuff. If we looked at your Spotify or your iPod, uh, what would be on it right now? Man, let me look. <laughs> uh, well, I did send my Guar uh, opening yeah. theme track. Um, I definitely appreciate is, that. <laughs> which is, and that one is actually almost an instrumental Guar song. There's sort of some lyrics in there, but it's 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 a little weird. Um, okay, first one that comes up is Mashuga, Mashuga, Elvin Jones, uh, Itchy Sun, just really dope DJ, Black Sabbath, uh, gosh, good stuff. My own bands. That's not my favorite. Thundercat. My own bands. How does this happen? <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, anyways. you got to listen to yourself. As it should be. <laughs> yeah. I, my favorite thing about like, like the Spotify or any of the apps is the way that they will send you stuff that it thinks you might like, and and then, for better or worse, I just let that stuff roll and like probably don't ever save it, you know, as much as I could benefit or or whatever. But I there's so much music in the world. I'm I'm certain we could all never have to listen to something twice. Right. Well, people laugh at me because I'm like, I don't ever listen to fish shows again. If I watch the stream or I see them, mm -hmm. I don't listen to the show again. And I'm like, because I'm never going to listen to everything I want to as it is. Why yeah, yeah. am I going to listen to something I heard? Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> so and then you get going on like international stuff and that's just the rest of your life. And it's awesome. But I totally agree. Um, but Guana, I think it's good. Guana funk from the seventies. You're like, yes, it's <laughs> the greatest thing ever. Yeah, you know, <laughs> but I think you all do a great job of helping to introduce people to, um, what do I call it? Jam band adjacent nice. type sounds yeah. or genres. And I think that helps expand people's horizons, even if they just get curious about like, what is that? You know, where does that yeah. come from? Hopefully it gets people thinking and maybe exploring a little bit more because, it is easy to get stuck in your like immediate scene, you know? Totally. And it's fun to surprise people with those influences too. Or like even myself, I will 
listen to some Metallica song or Pantera or something that I hadn't listened to and, you know, really listened to since like middle school or something. And then been like, oh, that's the drum fill that I play in this song. Like, oh, that's why I wrote that riff. You know, all these little very exact things that you forget about and they're just like deeply influenced, you know, versus like, oh, I was listening to this track, this Thundercat track the other day and it inspired me to write this kind of thing. It's like the, the deep forgotten ones. Right, you know what T.S. Eliot <clears throat> said, good poets imitate, great poets steal. Damn right. <laughs> I, I go hey. by that. that that's going to be on my grave. <laughs> but I'm we did cool. a thing with some of the singles off of the last one where we made like a playlist of songs that sort of influenced that song. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. I would and like to hear that. The album's day, you know? animated too on YouTube. You have the whole album animated. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was that's fantastic. So much, I guess, quarantine led to, hey, what's everything we can do with our music kind of thinking, huh? Yeah. yeah, we and we, you know, kind of got with some new management and they had all these great ideas and that kind of stuff. So, um, and then they were able to take the artwork from the board game, turn it into the animations. So it's just this like totally cohesive thing. And it's also like <clears throat> when you release it, it makes like a splash, but... <clears throat> it's over time when people will sort of realize they're like, whoa, this animation artwork is the same as the board game. It's a board game. What is this thing? And it ties back to other albums and all this stuff. And it's just, and that's when it like gets cool. Is it still available or did you sell out of the pressing? I believe we have like one box left. Mm. Oh, wow. Like well, we'll, they, we'll get a link. We'll get a link from you and put it when we uh, talk yeah. about this. Maybe we yeah, can totally. sell out the last few copies. So grab yourself one if you want it there. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I uh, Dopapod's taken off the rest of the year, but you got yourself a tour set up for the beginning of next year. Where are you guys yep. hitting? Do you know off the top of your head anything yes. big? With it? <clears throat> We're doing a little Colorado run, uh, followed by kind of up north and to the west and down. So there you like go, Colorado, <laughs> Montana, uh, Washington, Oregon, California, maybe Idaho in there. But mm -hmm. we've been itching to get back there. That was where we were when, or right before the kind of pandemic, we had done a run up to Seattle. And so, of course, they've been, and they were already starved from us. It's just, you know, it's hard to get up there. It's just so mm -hmm. big. It is. That's why yeah. I've never been to the gorge. Everyone's like, you got to go to the gorge. And I'm like, it's like a six day hike to get, you know? <laughs> yeah, I've never been there either. I actually really want to go there. Yeah, I might have to. Everyone's like, but if I do, I'm going to be one of those renting a room guys or renting an RV guy. Oh yeah, I'm not. No camp and no tents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great venues up there, and like serious music fans, really. They take they take the that stuff you know to heart. So I always feel like it's a great place to go see music. Um, I'm sure playing music there is is pretty similar too. Yeah, people are very stoked when we get up there. Nice. Uh, yeah, Colorado is such, Amanda knows this, it's such a fertile place for this kind of jam band, accepting of, like, so much stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it's like a weird melting pot, too. <clears throat> it's lots of jam and jazz and funk, and then some of those people were turned into a new hard rock metal band or whatever. <laughs> yeah, That's been one of the fun things for Color Red is, like, their original model was just like get some friends together and get in here and write a song and record it. And then some of those have turned into bands and other things. So it's really great. Oh yeah. Yeah. All the collectives and everything. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. Very Sweet. nice. So well, I know, um, I know we are, we are well over. Our just, I just hour. realized what time it is. Um, so, and I know you've got a gig tonight. I think I saw, right. That's true. Uh, down at the Appaloosa grill. Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah. Um, I'm in no rush, but what what project is it tonight? So this is this is just kind of this great place, Appaloosa Grill in Denver, um, has music every night, and it's a really great sounding little room. Um, and then my good friend Brant Williams is this guitar player. Uh, he has an amazing band called Many Colors. Definitely check them out. Um, oh, actually, he and I and also Dan again have another band called Radon which we've we've put out like seven or eight tracks and i think we've played one show but is again one of these like let's go play down at color red 
Um, Are you radon me. because you're silent but deadly there? I mean, radon gas is something you can't smell, <laughs> but it'll kill you. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, we, it was called that because earlier that day they installed a radon remover in my basement. There you <laughs> so go. I was like, Why don't we call it that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't know what it is, if you don't have to deal with it, I guess Colorado does. I live in Maryland. We deal yeah. with that. I sell real estate and it's always a problem. We get the readings yeah. and the, oh, the owner thing. doesn't want to put it in for the buyer and the buyer's like, screw you. <laughs> <laughs> no, they scare you with it out here. I was like, what? When I moved from the East Coast, I was like, Go I have die. no idea. <laughs> yeah, I don't want that. <laughs> but yeah, so this, this one, like Brant plays there almost every Tuesday. And so he will just kind of put together whoever's around and we mostly just improvise. And so tonight we have just me, Brant and Josh from Sun Squabby and uh, this guy, Barth is keyboard player. It's just, they're all badass, you know, musicians. So. And do you guys, where does the songbook come from? Stuff you guys uh, have written or covers or. Brant will often, Brant has a book of just like chord progressions that are maybe three or four chords. Maybe he has a B section or something and we'll decide like a feel on the spot and, That'll oh, be nice. kind of what we go around. Or Almost we'll improvised instrumental. Yeah. Oh, that's mm -hmm. beautiful. I wish I could drive over there now. That's yeah. fantastic. No, really. That's, we need more of that, but no commercial potential. You got to have somebody singing over top of it. Yeah, yeah. Kev, you just need to come out here for a couple weeks. I do. I, I think that's I need to. Thing. Maybe yeah. next year I'll stay a week after Dick's <laughs> or something. Yeah. You know, right oh, in yeah. March when the Colorado Dopapod run happens. Oh, there you go. Yes. I'm, I actually got invited to a wedding in LA. I've never been to California. And uh, I think I'm going to have, they're getting married on 32323. Because I guess nice. it's a palindrome. I bet you lots of people get married that day. I was going to say, that's not a mistake. Yeah. That doesn't just happen. <laughs> yeah, because it's a Tuesday. So, oh, yeah. yes. No, you'll get some you'll get some uh, monogram stuff with that yeah, on it. <laughs> definitely. It's it's one of the Wook Plus guys, so nice. Yeah, T's getting married. Very nice. Well, I guess we'll wrap it up. And um you got anything else you want to ask there, Amanda? Or? Um, no, I mean I just really appreciate this. This has been yeah, great. Thank you so and, much, um, yes. You're yeah. fantastic. You're you're a great interview. Awesome. Sometimes it's good tough to, to get stuff out of people. <laughs> hey, sometimes it's, you guys are good interviewers. Sometimes that's not the not there. Sometimes well, that's thank the weak you for side. That. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. We All had right, a good well, time. I'm, I'm going to pop this off and just hang out for a minute for us. Yeah.